Um, okay, but for now, I want to talk about thermal radiation and how different objects in space produce light. So you're probably familiar with thermal radiation, but maybe you just haven't heard the word before. It's just the idea that when you heat an object up, it glows. So if you have an electric stove burner, then you know that if you turn it on, it will start, you know, in its dark color, and then it'll glow brighter and brighter um, oranges, and then maybe yellow even if you get it hot enough as it gets hotter. And so this is true for all types of objects, not just your, your electric stove burner, but all objects that have a non-zero temperature emit some light at all light frequencies. And the black body spectrum is a tool that we're going to use, a graphical tool to understand how much light is emitted at each frequency or at each wavelength. So here's an example of a black body spectrum. Um, what we're looking at here on the x-axis is the wavelength, which is measured in nanometers. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. So these are um, billionths of a meter each. One nanometer would be one billionth of one meter. And we uh, measure the energy output at each wavelength for a given object like this hot burner. And so I'm, this plot in particular is for this burner. And the way that we figure out um, how much it puts out at every wavelength is by measuring its temperature. So the temperature of the burner is about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And in order to produce a black body spectrum, we need to know the temperature in units of Kelvin. I'm not going to cover the conversion, but your textbook will show you how to do this or any um, quick Google search will show you how to go from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Um, the reason we use Kelvin is because it's tied to absolute zero. And so any object that has a temperature greater than zero Kelvin produces a black body spectrum. All right, so at 922 Kelvin, it turns out that the largest amount of energy output or what we would call the peak of this graph, let me draw on, this is what I mean when I say the peak of the graph, the tallest point, um, the peak of that graph at 922 Kelvin um, happens at a wavelength around 3000 nanometers. All right, so that's an important uh, point that 3000 nanometers is determined uniquely by this temperature in Kelvin. So that would, um, that peak would happen at a different location. So it could happen at longer wavelengths. It could happen at shorter wavelengths if you had a hotter or colder object. I'll show you another example in just a second. And it turns out that this particular peak wavelength of 3000 nanometers occurs in the infrared. So all of the light, almost all of the light that this burner gives off is in the infrared. But I told you that some light is emitted at all frequencies. So we can actually count up how much light is emitted at other frequencies that's not within the infrared range. And if you make a table at 1200, or yeah, 1200 degrees Fahrenheit, then um, more than 99.999% of the light is in the infrared. But there is a vanishingly small amount in all of the other wavelength ranges as well. So here's an example of a hotter object. And now notice that I've got my rainbow guide here. So now we can see for this particular object, um, the peak now here, the tallest point of my graph, is happening somewhere in the green here near 500 nanometers. All right, this object happens to be the sun. Um, its temperature is 5,800 Kelvin. So we've gone up in temperature and thus we've gone down in wavelength. So we've gone to shorter wavelengths. Um, you can, maybe this is intuitive if we have a shorter wavelength, that's a higher frequency, higher energy, higher temperature, right? All right. So this is in contrast to our stove burner, which put off almost all of its light in the infrared. Now we're looking at an object that has some light in the visible, some light in the infrared, some light in the ultraviolet, and actually some light all the way out in the radio as well. So that's the energy output of the sun, the black body curve for our sun. Um, something else you can notice from this graph is that the visible wavelength range is in um, hundreds of nanometers. It runs from about 400 
to 700. All right, so if I wanted to produce a spectrum like this, um, how would I do it? Well, let's say that I, you know, see my hot source emitting black body radiation. I see it today, it's out there. Um, I would take some of the light from that and pass it through a prism, which breaks up um, the mixture of different colors that the sun is emitting into the individual wavelengths. And when I did that, I would produce a spectrum like we see here. Um, Newton was the first to do this. And this is what we call a continuous spectrum. So if you did it with a prism um, and you projected it onto a screen or something like that, you wouldn't see the infrared and you wouldn't see the UV simply because we don't have the detecting capability to uh, detect them with our eye equipment. Uh, but if you had a sufficient um, you know, filters or cameras that made it easier to um, detect that light, then you could do that too. And this is what astronomers do. We use uh, things like prisms and filters in order to look at different portions of a continuous spectrum to figure out what color an object is. So I told you that higher temperatures correspond to shorter peak wavelengths. And so my question for you is, if I measure the, um, the spectra for different kinds of stars, um, let's say that I have one that's 40, 285 Kelvin, one in one that's 7,500 Kelvin, which of those temperatures must uh, be the one that peaks in the red? Alrighty, I see the most votes for A, that the lower temperature object peaks in the red. That's exactly right. So the lower the temperature, the lower the frequency of light it will emit, and therefore the longer the wavelength. All right, so this is the, the type of rule of thumb that can help you understand whether Betelgeuse, the red star, or Rigel, the blue star in Orion would be hotter. All right, so if we have a higher temperature, then our star is gonna close, uh, peak closer to the blue end of the visible spectrum, or even beyond, stars can peak in the ultraviolet region as well. And cooler temperature objects would peak closer to the red end of the visible spectrum, or even out in the infrared. So this is how we can um, start to pull information out of the colors that we see from the light we receive from space. If we see light that is more red from a star, then we can deduce that it's cooler than a blue star. All right, and there is an equation that can help us understand exactly uh, what wavelength a given temperature object would produce. Um, that is how we made these graphs that are in the slides today. Uh, but we're not going to get deep into the weeds here uh, in this class. This is a topic that we cover in more depth in 122. All right, but for now, suffice it to say that if I plug 4285 Kelvin into this equation, then I get a peak wavelength of 700 nanometers. That's at the exact edge of our visible range. And a 7500 Kelvin temperature gives us the 400 nanometer violet peak. All right. Uh, the peak wavelength is not necessarily the color of a star. So it tells you about the relative color of a star, but it, if you have a star that peaks in the violet, it doesn't necessarily look purple to, to your eye. And the reason for that has to do with how we perceive color. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but I do want to um, just point this out because there aren't purple stars and there aren't green stars. You've probably noticed that in the sky if you've ever um, looked around and tried to find one of those. Um, so the amount of light at each wavelength that an object produces, that's what determines what uh, we perceive it as in our eyes. Um, so if an object emits more red than it does blue, then it will appear red. If it emits more blue than red, then it will appear blue. And if an object um, emits roughly equally across the entire visible range, then it will appear white to us. There's an additional layer of complication based on the types of light sensors in our eyes, what colors we're actually sensitive to, and those happen to be roughly red, green, and blue, but the green and red sensors actually have some overlap, and that's what um, results in red-green color blindness being one of the most common types of color blindness. Um, but the main point I want to make is that stars don't actually look the color of just their peak wavelength because they emit more than just light at their peak wavelength. So our sun 
peaks around 500 nanometers, which is around the green, but actually it has some uh, green light, some blue light, and also some red light. And those add together to give the color that we perceive, which is closer to a whitish yellow. Actually, it only really looks yellow to us on, on Earth because it filters through our atmosphere. Uh, images of it in true color in space look white. All right, if you wanna play with this, if you're really fascinated by the color vision, then there's a FET simulation that I'll link to on the slides that you can play with later. <laughs>